Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My guests today, Arturo Vargas, the CEO of Naleo. Arturo, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure. It's great having you on as uh, the executive director of the organization. Tell me a little bit about the organization. Well, the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials is a membership uh, organization, as the name suggests. But we're two organizations, Naleo, the membership, and the Naleo Educational Fund, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Both entities, are, you know, their sister organizations, share a common mission, increasing the participation of Latinos in American democracy. So at a grassroots level, we help legal permit residents become U.S. citizens. We encourage eligible voters to get out there and be heard uh, and to vote. We want to make sure everybody gets counted in the census. And then with our members who are elected officials, both Democrats and Republicans and independents, we want to make sure everybody uh, who is a political actor has ownership of Naleo. So it's not just for one political party or one ideology. As long as you believe that Latinos should participate, you should be part of our organization. Right. And once you're in office, we want to help that person be the best city council member, school board member, member, county official, state legislator that they can be. Regardless of party. Regardless of party. Because we firmly believe we need involvement in both parties. Because as we can see, it, there may be a time when one party is in power and unless you have a voice in that party, you have no voice in, in public policy. All right, well, we're certainly finding that out, uh, out <laughs> we today. Are. Uh, so you touched on so many different issues. Let's tackle some of them. And, and you, you mentioned uh, immigration. One of the fascinating aspects uh, from my perspective is that there seems to be no discussion of how difficult it is to obtain citizenship and that for those people who go through, attempt to go through the process legally, who fill out the paperwork, who do everything right, uh, the process is r extraordinarily and ridiculously bureaucratic and the time it takes, I mean, there are people who have been waiting over a decade to get fully processed. Talk about that aspect of becoming a citizen. Well, uh, the basic requirements is that you need to have been a legal permanent resident, a green card holder for at least five years. And you need to have proficiency in English and in civics. And in fact, you're, many times your naturalized citizens know more about how our government works than folks who are born here because these people actually study uh, government and civics and are three branches of government and what the stars and stripes mean. Um, but it's expensive as well. It's about $800. Now that may not sound like a lot for some people, but if you are, you know, you have a family of four, you have a, a low income job, you're getting minimum wage, $800 is, is costs a lot of money. And if everybody in your family wants to naturalize, you're talking about thousands of dollars. And you have to study for the exam. And you know, right now many folks uh, feel a sense of urgency that they want to become citizens because they want to be able to vote and to have their voice heard. But it takes time and there's a backlog. And, the uh, USCIS, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service, is funded only by the fees that applicants pay. There are no appropriations from Congress. So the amount of money that is used to process applications only comes from the applicants themselves, which is why sometimes it can take years for people to get processed. Well, it just seems uh, to me totally contradictory when, when politically people are saying, uh, and especially, well, I think people on both sides of the aisle, but certainly those on the right, saying, you know, we want people to go through the, the, through the legal process, we want people to do the right thing, and then we make it so difficult right. for them to do that. That seems to be a real contradiction. Well, and there's two things here. One is the process to become a citizen, and then the process to actually come into this country legally. And that's even more difficult. You know, we hear people say, well, they should get to the back of the line if they want to come in. There is no line. There is no line to come into this country because of our broken Im immigration system and the antiquated immigration laws that we have, which is why people actually circumvent the laws and they come here. And they wouldn't come here if there were jobs for them. So it's kind of a vicious cycle in that regard. All right, so what, would, what changes would you make to the system? If you could wave a magic wand in regard to legal immigration, what would you do? Well, I think we would, one, continue the priority on uniting families. You know, we, keep, we hear so much rhetoric about how we value the family, and the family should be kept together. Well, I'm all for that. Let's keep families together. I mean, let's look at what's happening at the border. You know, 
in, in this day and age where children are being separated from their parents. And it's, it's outrageous that our government is separating children from their parents and not even keeping track of which child belongs to which mother. I mean, how's that promoting the family? So what do we need to change so, so that we have a system that works and that accomplishes the objectives of, of the government, of the American government, uh, and, and also works for the people who are coming here, whether they're asking for asylum, whether they're seeking uh, to be citizens otherwise? Well, to be fair, I'm not an immigration lawyer, and this is in my expertise, but we do have values and principles that we believe should be applied to our immigration system. One is family unification. Let's keep families together. Second. We know that there are jobs here that need to be filled, and, and U.S.-born Americans, many of them, are not interested in doing those jobs. So let's match immigrants with the jobs, with the employers, in a systematic way so that people can actually come here and do the jobs that they want to do in order to get paid and that we need done. And then we need to give those people the opportunity if they want to stay and they want to become naturalized citizens, they need a path to citizenship. So one of the things that really uh, fascinates me is, is President Trump has uh, really embarked uh, on a, uh, a public relations effort to state that uh, it's the Republicans who want to secure the borders and Democrats want open borders. Though I, I have yet to hear a single Democrat say we want completely open borders. Uh, it, it seems when it comes to the, the media, the press, uh, and, and really the whole public relations aspect of it, uh, the, the president and his supporters uh, do a great job from their perspective of articulating their position and kind of demonizing uh, the other side. And, and the, the response from Democrats, from the left, seems to be very tepid. Why is that? You know, I, I don't know. And, uh, and what frightens me is how, in fact, immigrants are being demonized and how, you know, there, there's this... Uh, absolute approach to issues that you're either with me or against me. And you know that is not democracy. That's not the way we're supposed to have public dialogue in this country. We're supposed to debate ideas. We're supposed to figure out how do we move this country forward, bringing everybody along, not to say either you're with me or you're not. And if you're not with me, then you're un-American. And that's the approach that we're hearing in this country today, and it's really frightening. It, you know, in that regard, uh, one of the president's themes is that the Democrats have no plan, uh, they've not proposed any plan, uh, yet in 2013, uh, the U.S. Senate passed by a very wide margin uh, a, a uh, whole very comprehensive immigration reform bill, including support from both sides of the aisle. Why haven't Democrats gone back to that and, and said, not only have do we have a plan, but we agreed to a compromise plan, we passed it in the Senate, and it was the Republican House which stopped it. I haven't heard a word of that in response to the president. Well, you know, I am not here to defend the Democrats. I'm not an apologist for the Democrats. I have my problems with the Democrats. I don't think that, you know, they're actually articulating a good opposition, uh, policy opposition, to what is uh, being emanating from the, the White House. That 2013 Senate immigration bill, I think is an example of the best approach that we have to create law. It was bipartisan. Uh, it was the gang of eight, four Republicans, four Democratic senators got together and hashed it out. Nobody was happy with the bill. Everybody got, got something and that shows you that's compromise and that's moving policy forward. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back with Arturo Vargas in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. The Rexal Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations.
just make journalism great again. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at www.harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. We are with Arturo Vargas. So uh, one of the things I'm really interested in, and because of my past work uh, on one of the census, state census committees, is your thought about the 2020 census uh, and how it's being organized and changes that are being made for better or for worse. What's, what's your take on that? Well, you know, I've been involved with the census since the 1990 census. So this is my fourth time around working to promote a fair and accurate count of the U.S. population. And I have had a front row seat in watching this particular census be developed because since 2000, I have sat on the Census Bureau's National Advisory Committees, appointed by both Republican and Democratic Secretaries of Commerce. And I currently sit on the committee appointed by the Census Director, uh, National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Population Groups. So I've been watching the Bureau plan for 2020 when it started in 2008. I can say this. The census that the Bureau is about to implement in 2020 is not the census it has been planning for the past 10 years. Because over the past few months, the Census Bureau is being forced to make significant changes by adding questions, by not going forward with certain changes and procedures it was planning to do, to the point that right now, the Bureau is scrambling to figure out how it's going to pull it off in 2020. Add to that, that for the past few years, Congress has did not appropriate sufficient funding for the Census Bureau so it could, so that it could actually ramp up and do the, the testing and the tweaking of the new processes that it needs in order to pull off 2020. So all of us should be very, very concerned about the risks we have right now of having a very inaccurate 2020 census. So uh, tell me about these inaccuracies and in particular, what's being done intentionally uh, to change the outcome of the census? Well, you know, the most obvious change that I think everybody has heard about is that the Secretary of Commerce has ordered the Census Bureau to add a question on citizenship. Every single question that is on the decennial census questionnaire, the Census Bureau spends years testing the question in the field, through focus groups. They test every single word on the question. There has been no testing done on asking citizenship in the decennial census. Yes, it is asked on a sample survey, but that's one question out of 50. In the census that happens every 10 years, this will be one question out of nine. So that it really amplifies you know, the, the prominence of that question. And then we're living in an environment at the moment where immigrants and immigration is part of the toxic public dialogue. So add to that the toxic dialogue, the fact this hasn't been tested, and people's fear, you're going to have people running away from uh, participating in the census. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that we can result in a tremendous undercount of certain population groups, and certainly the Latino population. We already have an undercount in the Latino population. In 2010, 400,000 very young Latino children, ages 0 to 4, were left out of the census. And this is shown by actual evaluations of the 2010 census. We've been trying to get at those issues, and now we have this on top of that. What's really frightening to me is that this question is being added with absolutely no testing. If you read the Secretary of Commerce's memorandum in which he ordered this question to be answered, he says that nobody gave him any evidence that this question will scare anybody away from answering the question. That's ridiculous. And then he goes on to say, but in order for this question not to be intrusive, I'm going to order it to be added last with no evidence about the sequencing of that question being last. You know, that's the kind of thing that the Census Bureau tests. So that's really, uh, I think, uh, part of the biggest challenge that the Census Bureau is going to have to pull off 2020. Then there are other changes that are being done. For example, the Census Bureau was planning to significantly change the way it asks all of us to identify our racial and ethnic categories. Because the way it does it now with two questions, question one, are you Hispanic, yes or no? Then the next question, what is your race? It ends up that many Hispanics, about half of us, answer, yes, I'm Hispanic. You go to the race question, and we don't know what to do. 
Because we're like, I just told you my race. I told you I'm Mexican. And then the Census Bureau says, no, that's your ethnicity. Now tell me your race. And so people say, well, I'm not white. I'm not black. I'm not Asian. I'm not uh, Native Alaskan or Hawaiian or Native American. So I must be some other race. And they check that box. And then OMB says, well, there's no such thing as some other race. And then the Census Bureau goes back and assigns a racial category to those people, arbitrarily, using algorithms. So the Bureau's been trying to get out of the business of telling us what our race is and giving us an opportunity to just report it ourselves. And they came out after years of research, because everything the Bureau does requires research, they came up with a combined question where you can mark, out, mark off as many boxes as you want to identify your background, your ethnicity, your racial categories. OMB stopped that in its tracks. But why? We don't know. So is there, I mean, do you think there's just an intentional effort to suppress participation? Because certainly when you look at what the census is used for, uh, it's used for the allocation of federal dollars. It's used for redistricting in terms of congressional districts. Right. Uh, but let's say uh, you have Hispanic citizens that are not counted in a district, are not included. Uh, why is that bad? And could that be good? But, well, that, could that backfire on those who are intentionally trying to disenfranchise Hispanic right. citizens? There is absolutely no good that can come out of anybody being missed in the census. Because not only does it affect that person, that, person, that person's community is not going to get its fair share of political representation or, or resources, but everybody else who lives in that community is going to be denied their fair share of political representation and resources. And this isn't a Republican or Democratic issue. Red states have large immigrant populations, Texas, Arizona, Florida. If you don't count those immigrants, Texas, Arizona, Florida are not going to get their fair share of congressional seats. You know, many people say, oh, this is the way to really harm California's interests. Well, if you harm California's interests, you're also going to harm all these red states with large immigrant populations. So an undercount hurts everybody. Now, I don't subscribe to conspiracy theories, so I don't know the motivations, but I know the impact. And the impact is to have a bad census, and that just hurts everybody in terms of representation, distribution of public resources, and it also hurts our democracy. All right. On that note, we'll take our last break. We'll be right back with Arturo Vargas. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. Safely stop fires around your home. Introducing the Fire Ice XT 20 ounce aerosol canister. Fire Ice XT is an eco-friendly water-based fire suppressant gel. Unlike a traditional fire extinguisher, Fire Ice XT is a highly effective, non-toxic firefighting agent that is easy and safe to use around your home, family, and pets. Available at Amazon.com or call 800-924-4874. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbour Show. 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 Harbor Show. I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch The Aaron Harbour Show and Cheap Hope Alive. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24 seven at no charge from any location in the world at www.harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. This is our final segment with Arturo Vargas. So Arturo, I'd be really interested in kind of your uh, long view, your prognostication when it comes to uh, the Hispanic population in the United States uh, and its growth and, and, and what the country would look like in say 30 years. Well, this makes me optimistic because I intimately know uh, the Latino population of this country and the values it has and how much it's an entrepreneurial 
uh, population. You know, the, the fastest growth of small businesses are those being started by Hispanic women. And, you know, Latinos are patriotic. If you look at their service in the military, they're the most decorated group when it comes to medals of honor. And I think it bodes well for the country that we have this large population that is contributing. You know, we are 55 million Latinos in this country, about 17% of the population. We're now the second largest population group in the United States, second only to non-Hispanic whites, uh, and then followed by African Americans. So, you know, we are the future of this country. And if you look at states like California, uh, Latinos are a majority now of the youth in that state. Uh, in the 2010 census, 51% of all of California's children under 18 were Hispanic youth. And so you look at California today, it's the fifth largest economy in the country. You know, something's happening there. In, in the world. You're right. It's the fifth, fifth largest economy in the world. So diversity actually is not impeding success. So what happens in California, I think, can happen in the rest of the country. So I am optimistic. However, I know people are very fearful about demographic changes. And, you know, and I want to talk to you about that in terms of you know, what could we do, what could our leadership do uh, in America to, to tackle the challenge of racism? You know, I think the most significant thing that we all can do is to get to know each other. Uh, people assume, oh, if you, you dress funny, you talk funny, you're different, then you must not be like me. But if you get to know people, you learn that, you know, we actually have a lot in common. We love our children. We love our families. We all want a better life. We all wanna, want to make sure that you know, our children do better than, than we did. And I think that's all common values that we all share. And uh, you know, this country has been a phenomenal world success in world history, in part because we're so diverse, this nation of immigrants. You know, we are a laboratory that shows it can work. But there are so many people who are fearful of that change and uh, that what's gonna happen if America becomes a minority white country? Well, we're all people. And let's celebrate the fact that we can all get along. Well, it's going to become a minority white country. It's just a matter of when. And, and I guess what's, what's uh, interesting is the idea that it's not a zero-sum game, and too many people look at it as a zero-sum game, that if Latino people are doing better, that means if I'm white, white people are not doing better, when in fact both can do better. Absolutely. In fact, you know, I think that's a false uh, uh, dichotomy uh, to say that uh, you lose and I win, or I can only win if you lose. We can all win together. We help each other. And I think that's been the history of this country when we learn from our mistakes and you know we ended sa slavery and we gave women the right to vote and you know we, we do all these things where we all become equal we become stronger as a nation so let me ask you about leadership I'd be really interested in, in your thoughts about what what makes for a great leader I think what makes a great leader is somebody who thinks beyond him or herself and understands that they are part of a larger um, movement or mission, and, and I didn't look to the founder of my organization, Congressman Edward Roybal. He was the first uh, Latino elected to Congress in modern times from California back in 1962. He served in Congress for about 40 years. He became one of the 13 cardinals. He was an appropriator. But what was, for me, leadership was when he served in the LA City Council prior to being in Congress, he spoke out against McCarthyism. Now, he didn't have any skin in the game here. You know, in, in that era, they were going after people in Hollywood who were suspected of being communists. And here he was fighting for Latinos, but he understood, you know, being unfair to one group harms everybody. And he was able to stand up for that. The other thing he did in the 1980s is he was the first member of Congress to make sure that funds were appropriated for AIDS research at a time when nobody would even say the word AIDS or gay and as a Latino, with all the kinds of taboos in the culture, he stood up and said, we got to tackle this as a nation. So how about in the private sector? I know we only have a, a minute left. When you, you know, that's, uh, the private sector is that one frontier where we really need uh, to penetrate as Latinos. And how, how do we do that? How do we accomplish that? You know, um, we're trying to figure that one out. Tough question. It's a tough, yeah, it's a tough one. 
All right. Well, I, you know, I, I thought you'd at least have some ideas, but uh, uh, because let's get more MBAs. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and there aren't a lot of people at the top who can be mentors who, or who can be models. So how do you, you know, how do you change that? Well, uh, I would look at the experience that the African Americans have had. Uh, the African American community has had a great deal of success in corporate America. Not ideal, uh, but pretty good if you look at some of the. Uh, opportunities that have opened up, and we have to do the same in the Latino community. What else can your organization do? And, and as you look at the, my last question, what has your organization done when you, when you look at it right now and then looking into the future? Is there a particular accomplishment you're already proud of, and, and what do you hope to have accomplished in the next five or ten years? Yeah, well, we have directly assisted more than a quarter million people to become United States citizens. So I'm very proud of that. And we have helped scores of Latinas and Latinos in elected office be pretty good public officials and to figure out how to move public policy forward in a bipartisan, reaching across the aisle manner. So I'm pretty proud of the work that we've done at Maleo. All right. Thank you so much, Arturo. Thank you. That was Arturo Vargas. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour. The goal of my show is to inform viewers about a diverse range of topics, from our country's leadership to economic and tax policies to energy and environmental issues, with the participation of the most significant stakeholders in each arena. Our long-form approach gives each guest the time to fully speak his or her mind and gives the audience all the facts, allowing everyone to draw their own conclusions. Thank God you do your homework, and, and just doing what you do is enough to begin to let them know what's happening. I strive to bring together guests with perspectives from across the entire political spectrum to promote problem resolution through civil discourse. Keith Overman and Glenn Beck and Rush Babe, frightening people and using emotion, fear, guilt, and racism. What a bunch from the right and the left. I've personally experienced our democratic system from the inside, and I use my knowledge and expertise on the show to get clarification of major points and expand the discussion to ensure my audience gets the uncut truth. What is this bigotry against a third party candidate? Do the two parties own all the voters and everyone else should shut up and stand in line? We were on the campus together at Princeton University. Her Majesty does not look any different than she did uh, in those days, and I wish I could say the same about myself. I'm an ardent supporter of transparency in government and strive to play an active role in bringing out all the facts related to our nation's most challenging issues. One of the things I've learned in life, and you certainly have learned from doing your show, is you got smart people, but they're torn apart, they're polarized, you get into a media environment where it's not things like your show, but the shout shows on talk radio or cable TV, in which there's just this tendency to score political points and be polarized. I've also found my guests talk to others involved in our nation's leadership, and they have encouraged them to come on the program as well. Thanks for taking the time to check out the show. I hope this has been helpful in illustrating the nation's need for a balanced, nonpartisan program to shed light on today's issues. For more information, please go to www.harbortv.com or email producer at harbortv.com. And thanks for watching.